All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. We've got a great lineup of panelists to talk about an important topic, which is the video experience. So the way this is going to work to start is um, I'm just going to introduce the Streaming Video Alliance a little bit, which is who's bringing this webinar to you. And then we're going to go through each of our panelists to let them talk a little bit about themselves and you know what they do for the company they work for and maybe what their company does you know within the video industry as well and then hopefully at the end we'll have some questions that you guys pose um, obviously you can use the panel to ask a question and I will review those at the end of the webinar and what we'll do is we'll try to answer as many questions as we can and if we can't get to a question, um, I will, if it's directed specifically at a panelist, I will try and get them to answer it. So I will forward that question to them via email. And otherwise, I will try to answer all those questions uh, myself or get input from the panelist to uh, get you a response after the webinar is over. All right, so let's get started. Um, really quickly, the Streaming Video Alliance, if you're not aware, is a global group of companies that have come together to build best practices and specifications and requirements for online video. So our mission is to really drive consumer adoption of online video by enabling companies within the ecosystem to come together and create a better, uh, ultimately, user experience. All right, and you can find more about us at the website at the bottom of the slide. So you'll see it's streamingvideoalliance.org. Lots of information on there. You can download documents we've produced and, and all that sort of stuff. And of course, if you have questions about the SVA, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, personally, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, so let's talk to our panelists right now. And right now, we are unfortunately missing one panelist. That's Thierry. We hope he's going to join very soon. But so we'll uh, we'll start with Pete Mastin at IBM. If Pete, you can just uh, introduce yourself. You know, talk a little bit about IBM and what you guys are doing in video. Sure, happy to, JT. Uh, my name is Pete Mastin. I work in the cloud video group at uh, IBM. My role is uh, strategy and business development over there. Um, the cloud video group is dedicated essentially to building and uh, you know a SaaS uh, cloud-based video uh, applications to allow people to tell their stories better. So if you think about what video is, it's the the most sophisticated way humans have, have, have discovered so far to really tell stories. And so we have everything from broadcast quality OTT level facility, um, all, you know, both for ingest, uh, you know, tagging, managing, um, and and delivery, um, but we also have live streaming uh, as well. So we have uh, we acquired companies uh, to get there as well as building stuff internally. Um, so that's more or less where IBM is with it. It's recently been merged into the um, Watson Group. So we have a, a cloud Watson Group that is um, all one thing. So moving forward, it looks like we're going to be looking at some of those kind of features as well. Oh, very cool. Thank you, Pete. Uh, let's move on to Chris Michaels at Wowza. Uh, thanks, JT. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm the Director of Communications and, and uh, Streaming Industry Evangelist here at Wowza, uh, helping spread the good news of uh, all, all things streaming. Uh, Wowza, we um, power a number of applications, uh, streaming applications and experiences for over 20,000 customers uh, in about 170 different countries. Anything from uh, major social media outlets and Periscope and, and uh, UGC uh, content to uh, events like the Olympics and, and uh, major broadcasts. We've been uh, the streaming engine to help carry the uh, broadcast video to anywhere in the world at any scale uh, to any device. Uh, so we've been happy to be doing that for just about 10 years now and uh, continue to see the bright horizons of all things uh, streaming and, and uh, uh, the user experiences here. Oh, that's great, Chris. Thank you very much. And let's move on to Aaron Sloman at Unzums. Hey guys, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm the CTO at OwnZones. Um, OwnZones uh, has a couple of different products and platforms we offer. Uh, one is more consumer focused, where we actually create and curate uh, OTT channels, channels that might be provided under advertising models, under subscription models, or TVOD, transactional models. And we actually 
um, serve that through our own applications at ownzones.com as well as all of our apps. And then we have about another 20 apps out in the ecosystem on all different platforms, uh, ranging from set-top boxes to cable boxes to mobile devices, where we take those channels and we distribute them for our partners. Uh, we have another product too, uh, which is more of a distribution play, where we work with major content creators like studios and um, other independent MCNs, and we transcode and deliver their stuff out to the major OTT OTT providers in the marketplace, and so you know we're kind of disruptive with cloud. We're cloud-based. We support formats like IMF, and we have some pretty advanced workflows, and so we kind of feel like we're you know somewhere between the content creator and the consumer of content, and we you know we're part of that transaction in the middle. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Aaron. And I have found Thierry. <laughs> so Thierry, can you hear us? Can you speak? I'm not sure if you're on mute or not, but I have promoted him to a panelist out of the out of the general pool of listeners, and well, hopefully he'll come off of mute and and join us shortly. All right, why don't we get started with some of the questions? So obviously, there's a big concern in the industry about the online video experience and how to make it better. Uh, and I say that because most consumers are used to a video experience working fantastically, right? They're used to sitting down on a couch and, and grabbing the remote and pressing the on button and there's just a, a beautiful picture and there's no buffering and there's no artifacting and there's no jitter and there's great quality. And, and, I, and I think there's this, you know, feeling in the online video industry of trying to get parity and in some ways even making the online video experience better than the traditional TV experience. So let me start out with this first question, and it's kind of a general question, and anybody can jump in. You know, where is the video experience lacking today? Is it, you know, is it quality of video? Is it uh, content discovery? You know, what what do you think it is today that's really bringing down the online video experience and, and making it so that people aren't all jumping on to this new way of watching video? If I could answer, this is Chris. Uh, one of the things, we recently completed a survey of over 700 different uh, people who are building streaming applications. One of the things that was a common thread is that many of, um, of the applications that are be being built, streaming is not enough. You know, providing a video is not enough. What's being created now are the layers of interactivity that surround the video. Um, you see this in uh, you know, sports applications where you have live streaming data and, and NDVR and clips and things that, that accompany the video experience. And we're becoming such a, and at least our research has shown that we're becoming such a uh, data or, or streaming plus, you know, it's streaming plus interactivity, streaming plus data, streaming plus uh, being able to like, curate and, and um, uh, uh, create um, where everything is is dependent also on that data level of experience. So I, that's one thing that we're seeing a lot of people trying to solve both in, ter in terms of the new applications that are coming out, but also constant demands from our customers is how, how to deliver both of the experiences seamlessly. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in on that too, Chris. I mean, this is Pete. Uh, I think I would actually turn the question around. I think other than quality of experience and some of the stuff JT mentioned, uh, you know, uh, being able to find find the content. But other than that, uh, the over-the-top experience, generally speaking, is much better because of the interactivity and the second screen and, and the other kind of elements of that experience that you can, you know, bring to bear. So, uh, you know, there is still some QOE issues out there, no question about that, and there are ways to, to get around and fix that, I think. Um, but but overall, the the experience uh, of video um, off of broadcast I think is generally speaking much better in terms of interactivity just because you have the capability yeah I would I would definitely agree this is Aaron um, you know one of the challenges I see and I think we, we might talk about it a little bit more in this um, call as well is discoverability um, you know I, I think the experience is actually getting really good it's just really hard to work out where you're going to find what you want to watch and um, and how to find it. You know, things like deep linking 
um, on some of the devices like Apple TV and Roku and stuff like that and Amazon are helping but we've got such a fragmentation out there of apps you know um, I think about my kids they they go to four or five different apps to consume their content and we're starting to hear that the content creators and the broadcasters are eventually you know each gonna kind of have their own app um, it's sort of a trend that I, I heard I was at New York two weeks ago and I was talking to three different major uh, TV networks and each one of them was like yeah it's great that we're putting our stuff in these other places but eventually we're going to need our own apps and so then it becomes where is that that guide of oh I want to catch the baseball game tonight or I want to catch uh, you know the news or I want to catch something um, we're finding it's quite fragmented and there's subscriptions in different places and quite often you're paying for the same content three or four times uh, and so I think in some way we have to go through this battle of seeing you know who are the strongest apps and which ones will survive there's obviously three or four so far that have and there's probably space for another 10 or 20 maybe but as that convergence happens um, the customer experience has got to get easier uh, it's, it's really hard when you buy something on your TV and then you pick it up on your phone and you want to watch it and the uh, the device because one's Apple Pay and one's on Roku uh, depending on the OTT platform, a lot of those platforms won't support and carry those in-app purchases across those devices. So literally, you could be watching your living room and want to walk upstairs and you know cast it onto your TV, and you don't have a license for it. And so, I think I think there's just a lot of work to be done. And I think the uh, fragmentation is actually part of the innovation that's going on because there's so much innovation. Um, so we don't have standardization, and that's in some way what our SVA group is all about, right? is trying to bring standardization to make this whole market more successful. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and those are those are all great responses and you, you guys are all pointing out critical challenges that we're facing in building a better online video experience. I I'm going to focus on one a little bit uh, just just for um, just for a question and that one's really going to be focused on delivery. So, thinking about you know latency and the the inherent latency that we have in streaming with HLS for example you know wh what are some of the critical challenges for delivering video over the internet because obviously that's where that's where we're moving right that's where broadcasters are moving that's where uh, pure play OTT providers you know are starting so what do you think some of those critical challenges are in, in actually just delivering the content to the user well, I, this is, yep, go ahead. <laughs> We're both being polite here. I, I'd say from our perspective, it, um, it's a lot of a question of uh, um, are you delivering a live linear experience or a thought experience? You know, a live linear uh, experience, something that, that we see people trying to, uh, to um, tackle is, you know, the multicast and being able to deliver through a CDN out to the edge. Uh, with uh, the same amount of, of latency or expected latency so that, you know, Thursday Night Football, when it came to Twitter originally, um, you had 90 seconds of latency. And, and so when somebody's watching, you know, the Patriots march down the field, they might get a spoiler in their feed that a touchdown happened 90 seconds before they're able to watch it, which provides a horrible user experience. I think everybody would, would agree. Well, the Patriots scoring a touchdown anytime would be a horrible user experience. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, how, understanding how latency. I mean, we're we're in the uh, Veruca Salt. I want it now. You know, I I expect the the same amount of latency from a streaming experience as I would as when I'm turning it on on TV. I want it the time to first frame to be instantly when I select it, and I expect that end to end latency to be identical to what I, I experience online. And so people trying to uh, tackle that, whether it be in you know, reducing the chunk sizes in HLS or Dash and, and trying to uh, build in, uh, architectures, uh, techn technology stacks that can, can drive that, uh, much like what Facebook has done. Facebook runs in sub-second uh, um, uh, Dash segments and delivers four seconds into end latency. Uh, which is unheard of. I mean, they, and they've got the the muscle to do that from a technology stack, but not everybody has that. Yeah, I think it probably also pays to to mention that there's there's 
most of the major broadcasters, OTT broadcasters are, are either have already implemented multiple CDN, multiple cloud uh, to get around some of the latency and throughput availability issues that that some CDNs have with particular networks. So if you think about you know how a CDN is peered with a specific ISP, uh, you know that a different CDN might have a much better peering. So by implementing a you know performance-based multi-CDN solution, you can actually overcome some of the latency and throughput that is inherent in a best effort network like the internet. Jason, can you hear me? We can hear you, Terry. Yep. Okay, sorry. Uh, I had a technical problem, so maybe I introduce myself, Thierry Fautier from Harmonic, and we are deeply uh, interested and vested in all these broadcast versus uh, unicast experience. So one of the comments I would like to make is when we started OTT eight years ago, I believe we were in the early days and making long segments and caching through CDNs and all those things. So uh, we see in commercial service about 30 to 40 uh, second delay, which is uh, absolutely a, a, a non-starter point for sports applications. Uh, what we're going to show at IBC, NAB actually is going to be a matching delay between OTT and broadcast, so same encoder in broadcast mode and one in OTT mode will be able to demonstrate there is no more delay if you optimize the complete delivery chain using CMAF type of uh, new formats. And I think this is going to be a huge relief, especially for uh, operators, broadcasters who want to have live events uh, such as sports events. So I think we are getting there. And the next step, of course, is to productize this and to make it available to end users, uh, hopefully this year. Yeah, that's that's really great. I think I think live is definitely a a big factor and a challenge um, with that delay. Um, the other challenge that that we've been finding at OwnZones that we've been working very hard is just the whole idea of OTT now making the world flat, right? <laughs> and by the way, I'm not you know one of the basketball guys saying that the world is flat, but uh, but this idea now that I have a piece of content and it doesn't have geographic boundaries like it used to. You know, so distribution agreements no longer sold to a particular network in a particular geo. Um, you know, it's normally you can put it in all of these countries, um, except for these ones where we have you know exclusive agreements. And so we're finding um, latency is very challenging when we're in Eastern Europe or even uh, Western Europe when we're in Asia. Uh, you know, the infrastructure that we have in the states. Uh, with the number of CDNs and the, and the backbones and stuff is pretty phenomenal. There's actually really good backbones in a lot of those countries and a lot of fiber and stuff like that. Um, but we're finding there's generally not enough CDNs close enough to where the populations are um, as you launch a product. We, we've got a product right now that, you know, over the next year we're launching in 12 countries. Um, and every country has a different you know, CDN provider that happens to be better than the other guy, right? So it's not like you can just say, oh, we're going to standardize on one or two CDNs and we're going to be successful because we're finding that that's not the case um, across these countries. And so uh, things like open caching and things like that and more standards out there where we might be able to, in the future, share files, um, you know, across OTT platforms um, with entitlements and things like that and DRM. Uh, and also was the standards standardize a little more, you know, it's a little challenging that we have multiple streaming standards. <laughs> but as these things start to unite, we're going to see much more consolid consolidation and much more efficiency in the networks. And so, again, I think we're in such a frenzy right now with so many cool new features and so many companies vying to, to sort of own the space. Um, it, it, it's going to slow down a little bit, and I think as it standardizes, it'll be better for the end users too. Absolutely. All right. So um, that's that, guys. Th those are great answers and a great discussion around, you know, that question of of what are some of the critical challenges to delivering over the internet, which is, um, you know, a best effort network. Um, so let me ask. I'm, I'm going to ask a question specifically of Thierry, and then you know everyone else um, after Thierry answers, everyone else is is more than welcome to chime in, you know, with their thoughts. But one of the things that I've, I'm wondering, and I think our audience is probably wondering at times, is, you know, quality of video, so the visual quality, 
right? What people actually see is an important aspect of the experience itself. You know, obviously, as you move up and down the stack of video quality in a, you know, in an adaptive bitrate stream or um, or asset, you know, it makes a huge difference in how people feel about you know, what they're getting, whether it's value for money or time spent or, you know, whatever. That that visual quality is really important. So, Thierry, I want to ask you a little bit as the encoder guy on the panel, um, how does the quality of video impact the experience? Okay. So, first of all, I'm going to break a myth. Quality is not equal to bitrate. So, the adaptive streaming community has decided long, long time ago, back to the HLS days, that you have a different level of bit rates and people believe this was equal to quality. So what we have discovered uh, working and researching on this topic is that we can encode the content at a much lower bit rate than what is being described in the manifest and have as good or even better quality. So what we do is we are measuring online during the encoding process the perceived quality of the eye and we call that IQ and embed that into our encoding system, which means that we are going to dynamically request more bits or less bits for a frame or a chunk. And at the end of the day, what we can reach is much lower bit rate on the network, which means on the other end, on the receiving side, you are going to get a better quality of experience because you are going to request in average up to 50% less bits than what you would get in the classical ladder defined by HLS. So to summarize, we are measuring in real time the quality on the encode side, and we are deciding to increase or decrease the bit rate. And on the receiving side, you have always lower bits, which means the chunks are always coming faster than what you would do uh, applying the brute force method as it is done today with HLS. Oh, very interesting. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? You know, one thing that we've um, heard from a number of our customers, especially from news organizations, um, has been uh, a willingness to sacrifice high quality video in order to at least get the audio and latency down as, as much as possible. Um, meaning that most of their their audience would actually rather listen to a story than miss out and have interruptions or um, have uh, you know, super high quality at, at the risk of, of getting old news. Um, so that was something that we found very interesting from our news organization, whereas you know, many of the other, um, uh, whether it be gaming systems or, or UGC contents, um, many of them want to be able to create higher quality uh, video and deliver that differently um, and, and people expect a different user experience than they do necessarily with the news. Yeah, I mean from I guess IBM's perspective what we're seeing is a demand for for quality. Uh, I'll give you an example. We recently uh, executed the uh, the 4K broadcast uh, from Augusta, the Masters, um, this uh, week and a half ago and, and Essentially, you know, we built apps that ran on Samsung, Sony, and LG. That we did the live encoding on site in Augusta, and, and um, we used you know some advanced technology to to generate 4K. But you know, it's 4K now. In another few years, it's going to be 8K, and and then and and it's just going to keep going up. So the demand for quality, I, I don't think there's any one technology that will ultimately be able to scale to add to to make to ensure that the you know that you're always be able to get the newest best uh you know you know bit rates or um because it, it's it's the whole value chain has to be improved consistent you know constantly and it's there's no one piece of it i think that uh independently can can solve the problem yeah that's a really important point that you bring up and it, it actually leads me into the next question um, you know, because obviously there are lots of different challenges with respect to the online video experience. And as I just pointed out, we talked about quality, you know, visual quality is one. But another one um, is something that Aaron had mentioned earlier in the 
uh, in the discussion, and I'd like him to sort of tackle this question first, is, you know, what's the relationship between the ease of discovering new content and the viewer experience? And, and ultimately, you know, does it need to be improved? And I, I, I think your answer is probably going to be yes to that. Um, and if so, you know, how can we improve it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I certainly think it can be improved. Um, what we're seeing uh, some of the OTT uh, devices and, and platforms doing now is providing things like universal search um, with what I was referring to as deep linking, where when we submit an app into that platform, we also submit them data files that update with our feeds. And so now if you're on, say, Roku, is, is what I have on my television, in my living room, I type in a movie, I now get you know hits for five or six apps that may have that, that movie in, in there. Um, so that's the beginning of it, but it's pretty bad because um, some of those apps I already have a subscription in, some I don't, the search doesn't really know what channels I have a subscription to and which ones I don't. Um, and so it's a little hit or miss, uh, you know, many times um, you may actually go and buy it again or you, you may not know that it's offered up, you know, maybe it's in the vast Amazon library under Prime or something and you go and you buy it off, um, off another service provider. Um, but I think, I think where we need to head with this is, is more standardization around things like uh, you, you know, um, I hate to say it, but in the linear world, the, um, the, the Cable Labs guys did a great job. Um, and it's not that I hate to say it, but it seems like this technology is so old now when we think about OTT, but around authentication, you know, I can log on to um, my FoxNow app on my Roku box and I can use my Dish TV credential, right? Um, there's no kind of federated uh, authentication um, across these systems. Um, every time I go somewhere, I have a new account uh, or I have an in-app purchase on a particular platform that doesn't move move with me. With me. Um, the metadata is very, um, very antiquated. Um, you know, the searchability of that metadata. As we bring more and more content online, uh, we have to make sure that the quality is there. Um, our Zipline product that we have at OwnZone is one of the things we have is these smart agents. And if we have an episodic series of content, um, say we're doing you know two shows a week and it's a, a season over a year, uh, we've got agents now that are warning our operators saying, hey, you're using the same descriptions for every one of those episodes, or you're using the same image for every one of those episodes, because you don't want to be on a big screen there and going through you know, a, a, a series and a show, series of shows and seeing the same images on the screen and the same metadata, and it just says you know, series one, series two, series three, or episode one, two, three. And so there's so much work to be done because the, the power of OTT is that we're unharnessing years and years of video. One of our customers um, in, in the UK has um, tens of thousands of videos, you know, dating back to the very first cameras they ever had, um, which they're now making available under an SVOD subscription. Well, that's really great, but um, how is it indexed? How is it curated? Um, are there predictive analytics and you know, I know the guys at IBM and some of the other companies are working on that But those predictive engines are really only as good as the data they get given and so um, We're finding we're spending a lot of time Helping our customers put in better data get better images build better, you know supporting files linking the actors and actresses together all those things that happen to make a, a really great experience um, and uh, and I think we've got a, a long way to go as we get more formats, you know, uh, we get things like VR, <laughs> and so we're just going to throw and throw more variations into the mix here, and so, um, you know, some companies are pushing really hard to build standards around it, like Netflix and stuff like that, but, you know, that's sort of an industry giant, it's not something that's, you know, widely adopted, so it'd be interesting to hear what the other panelists think about this too. Yeah, Aaron, I, I can't help but uh, to speak up. Uh, this is Pete from IBM. Um, and I'll give you an example of, of something that we did that was very much in line with exactly what you're talking about. Uh, during the Masters, we also um, did a, uh, we, we, we built essentially a, a, you know, a product, a proof of concept that extracted uh, the data in real time. So it was taking the, uh, the video and audio feeds and it was uh, tuned 
to recognize crowd cheering, uh, you know, fist pumps, high fives, commentator excitement, you know, shot boundary detection, those kind of things. Um, and, and then essentially mark those segments. And then those segments could be added to an interactive dashboard that then could be reviewed by a video editor and, and punched out into the live broadcast. So you're exactly right that, you know, that being able to enrich that, that a stream, whether it's being done in real time live or our VOD um, is incredibly important, especially when you have these large VOD libraries, ex exactly, you know, the use case that you were talking about. So that is, you know, very much on our mind over here. Yeah, and it, it actually, um, if you think about the volume of what we're getting, <laughs> you know, because the guys at Wowser and that are doing such a good job with like the live delivery piece of it, uh, you know, we, we have channels for some of our clients where we have, you know, live TV that we're streaming and then we're also doing cloud DVR. It's kind of like a assumed capability now by any 10 year old kid, right? I can watch it live or I can watch it whenever I want to. Well, just gathering and collecting that metadata of that live, that live content on the fly so you can time shift it, miss the start of that show and pick it up 10 minutes later and it be in a channel guide with the right description and the images and stuff like that. It's, it's a lot of work when you think about the, um, you know, the number of content sources that we have that are basically streaming into this, you know, this, this big cloud we have, right? Yeah, and actually that, that leads to another interesting question. And this is, this is directed at Pete, actually. Um, and Chris, you mentioned this a bit too. You talked about sort of streaming plus, which I, I really like that. I think that's a great um, concept. And you've talked about, you know, data and interactivity and things like that. And, you know, Pete, you mentioned that you're being folded into the Watson group. And so I wonder, you know, if you can take a crack in answering the question of what role does data play in improving the video experience? Well, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of data, right? There's data around latency throughput and availability on certain networks that you can use to switch from, you know, one CD into another. There's data in the asset itself. So there's the soundtrack, there's scenes, there's actors' faces that can be recognized. There's, you know, is the character happy? Or are they angry? Um, you know, scenes that where people are screaming at each other can be notated, and, and then you can search. I want to, I want to see all the scenes where people are angry, for instance, as an example. Um, there's also, and we touched on this a little bit earlier. There's also data uh, about your consumers, right? So what people watch, and so as you start to merge these data sets, and you can start to do some very interesting things. For instance, obviously from an advertiser's perspective, if they knew the habits of certain um, certain types of subscribers to a service, they could they could make recommendations and or advertise certain products that were um, of the type that that person is likely to respond to. Um, likewise, from the other direction, you can recommend content that is. Um, essentially appropriate for those users. So uh, the data, but it all starts with the data. And, and you know, as Aaron mentioned, the data is, uh, sometimes it's completely unstructured. Sometimes it's, um, it comes in the forms of databases or, you know, is the form of measurements. And so all of that has to be, um, you, you have to have a way to ingest all that data in real time and rapidly go through it. And most importantly, learn about the data because no matter how good your algorithm that you would build today, if, if you're not learning uh, about, uh, you know, the, to how to become, you know, recognize trends uh, better then you're, you're certainly not going to, whatever you produce today is not going to be good in a, you know, a year. So um, it's very important uh, that you, that you're using active learning techniques as well. Yeah. And, and a lot so of maybe that, a, uh, stuff that I was going to say a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing with Watson in terms of, you know, building recommendation engines or, or contextual learning based off of NLP and being able to listen in on a live stream, a UGC stream, and build a metadata database on that is, is some of the way that's going to help drive some of that new content discovery and uh, make those databases more accurate instead of bringing over an old antiquated uh, 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 metadata development systems. Absolutely. 
And did you so have one of the one of the elements I think is important in the quality of experience and data analytics discussion is to be able at the client to capture some events and to feed this back to the server and uh, therefore see what are the profiles which are played and how they are played and what are the, the delays and what are the buffering aspects. So I think we'll see that as a mandatory feature uh, moving forward and I'm quite happy uh, to see that CTA is having a specific QE uh, initiative in order to standardize all those metrics so that all the players and all the encoders can talk the same language. And I really advise for those interested to, to discuss more about this, to see our demos at NAB. We will show our own uh, analytics servers, and, uh, and I think it's quite interesting, especially to explain to service providers what are the benefits, how many buffer uh, the events they can reduce. And you can see on some uh, specific condition, you, you can do a lot of improvements on that. No, absolutely, and I'm glad you brought the CTA up um, with regards to QOE. It's actually an organization that the Streaming Video Alliance has a partnership with, so we've pushed uh, the work that our QOE working group did into their QOE working group, so there's a really tight coupling, and I know that you know a couple of people on the call, sort of Aaron, and, you know, have talked about standards as you know needed in the industry, and you know it's really great to have standards bodies or industry associations working together to accomplish that. So I think that's I think that's great that you brought that up. Um, let me let me turn back a little bit to uh, to the question of video delivery again. And this and this is a question that's directed at Chris. Um, you know, obviously there are lots of components involved in the delivery of video to an end user. It's not just here's a video, play it. There's lots of stuff in between. Um, obviously, Wowza is a you know a fantastic media server that's uh, you know that, that thousands of companies are using around the world to deliver video. So, Chris, if if you can answer this question, um, what are some of the elements of video delivery that can be optimized to improve the quality of the viewer experience? Well, if, if I could answer that by myself, I'm sure Harmonic and IBM and everybody wouldn't be in business. Uh, <laughs> But I can't. I, you know, it it goes to the really what you said. We are a, a, a network of technologies that are built together to deliver. And really, what we're seeing is anything from encoding, transcoding, delivery methods, CDN utilization, using cloud or on-premise um, uh, uh, stacks. Um, all of that is impacting how people are delivering. Uh, and and I think the the biggest consideration that um, we're trying to address right now is solving for the latency equation. I mean, latency has become one of the most impactful metrics for overall quality of experience that we've seen from UGC in gaming. End-to-end uh, -end latency means um, uh, in, impacts the authenticity of the experience and being able to engage with a broadcaster or your audience, uh, which in some cases directly re relates to revenue. You know, for every um, Hundred milliseconds of latency, you you see a drop off in terms of conversions um, with in, in experience. Uh, for news and sports, latency means getting it fast. Where time to first frame is the core metric that defines that perceived high QOE, um, as well as the end, you know looking at the end to end. So, I mean, I, I I'd say that that's one of the biggest challenges is trying to identify you know what's going to be the right protocol and delivery method. Um, to get your content to your customer uh, quickly, um, but also how to do it in a uh, resilient um, uh, network or, or infrastructure uh, that can intelligently manage and monitor and let you know when something's going to happen, when detecting that there's going to be downstream or last mile uh, interruptions or, or um, latency uh, interjected based upon the network conditions, um, or even at the, the front end, uh, there's something in the settings side that is preventing it. And so having that intelligence built into a network that can help you um, identify issues before it becomes a problem for both you as the broadcaster and your customer as the, the uh, audience. Um, those are going to be some things that, that I, I think we're going to see you know, in the near future at, at NAB um, and IBC soon uh, this September, that, that those are going to be the advancements of, uh, that will help improve the, uh, the overall quality of delivery. Anyone else have anything to add to that? 
Well, I would like maybe to, to give some lighting on the mobile delivery because one of the challenge we have on mobile is the bandwidth is very, very limited. And what we see for people who are using Periscope type of application, the first codec is from phone to um, the data center or the internet. And here, when we talk to the phone manufacturer, I'm hearing things like uh, HD is encoded at 20 ish megabits per second, which is extremely high. So, of course, you can reduce the resolution to SD, but in that case, nobody is going to see any details. So, I think we have also to work on the weak links. And today, one of the weak links is the upstream bandwidth from the phone to the internet. And I think this will be one of the challenges uh, we as an industry need to, to solve in order for people to have this type of uh, periscope type of application where it's great to have an absolutely uh, powerful delivery network, but we have to solve it also on the device, on the emission point. Yeah, the, the 5G networks that most people, are, uh, most of the mobile um, MVNOs and, and major operators have been talking about have really been focused on the down, uh, the, the download, not the upload. Uh, or at least the interlinking and, and backhaul. But um, you, you hit the nail on the head for a broadcaster or a mobile live broadcaster, you know, somebody who's going to the front lines of a protest and wanting to send it up to a uh, major cable network. They're, they're, there's a specific level of quality, both in terms of what you can transmit um, and the network uh, needs to be able to handle uh, the load. Um, so those are two things that you know, uh, unfortunately, are out of many of our hands here. Um, but those are ap you absolutely hit the nail on the head when it comes to a, a mobile experience. Well, we, we talked to the chipset, the mobile chipset guy, and for them, the to increase the performance <clears throat> of the chip on the device, it costs money. So they don't see a business model yet. Uh, maybe the business model is to save on the storage of the device when you recall with your mobile phone and you move from 32 to 64 gig. So in that case, I think there will be an interest for them to improve the efficiency. But if everything goes mobile on the consumption and reception, I think we need to have the mobile people, companies, and also network operators to, to be aware that we need to work on the end-to-end -end solution, not only on the cloud, which is quite comfortable architecture for all of us. Yeah, I definitely think that we could probably have an entire panel discussion just on mobile. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously where a lot of consumption is moving towards. But but I'm going to ask about I'm going to ask a question about sort of the other elephant in the room. And when you talk about the online video experience, you can't help but ignore this and its monetization, and specifically advertising, right? So so I I, I saw this funny quote um, a few weeks back. And somebody had said that, you know, kids who have grown up watching only Netflix don't know what a commercial is. So they have no sense of broadcast television or linear broadcast and seeing commercials. And I thought that was very interesting. So I, I'm going to ask this question, and, and maybe somebody will play devil's advocate, but what's the impact of advertising on the video experience? Well, I'll, I'll throw... Uh one point out which is they one element of that quote is that they haven't seen advertising but i would dispute that because they've certainly seen product placement style advertising on netflix right i mean they've seen certain brands of cars and certain brands of computers so advertising has evolved in into that space in a different way than it was being pursued in broadcast um but but there is advertising even on netflix um I mean, I, I get the bigger point you're making, the bigger question you're asking, but um, advertisers are clearly getting getting into uh, you know into into those assets as well. I have a, a three-year-old and an almost six-year-old who both are kind of in the Netflix generation, um, and, and I compare what they've seen and what they've experienced to somebody that might be. You know, in China, because many of the streaming services and things that happen there, they do in in broadcast. They don't have commercial breaks like we would expect them. They have in programming uh, uh, advertising and, and clickable things that happen in the program. So you can send your uh, uh, host a you know Coca Cola or order one and have it delivered to your home. Something along those lines.
Hello. I think we're I'm back. Here. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. So it was a bit of a crash. <laughs> I think Chris is uh, Chris is offline still. Um, yeah. So yeah, back to that. You know, back to that question, and and actually extending that question a little bit. You know, Chris brought up some really interesting points about other markets and and how they do or approach advertising. You know, this concept of interactivity and clickability and ordering and things like that. You know, d does or will or can personalization provide a better advertising experience? Uh, absolutely. Uh, if, you know, you know, the more you know about someone the more you can, you know, whether you're using the personalization to actually, you know, position certain products or whether you're using the personalization to position a product in a certain way, um, the more you know about your target, the more effective your advertising is. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think there's always that um, trade-off, right? Uh, own zones for the first five years of our existence was we're ad free, we're premium video channels, you know, a couple of bucks a month, you get exactly what you want with no ads. And um, we have evolved <laughs> uh, because our customers are evolving, you know, our content owners, you know, they say, hey, I've got this, you know, 300 title collection of country and western or something. We know that we can monetize it, we're not sure that we can monetize it, you know, at an SVOD rate that we'd like to get, but we know that we can cross promote this with a number of advertisers that are in that you know demographic with those segments of users. Let's see if we can put that together and let's offer this under AVOD um, with advertising. So um, I think what OTT provides us with is individualized information about the viewer. Um, also, it's more specific content, you know. Uh, you advertise, you know, certain products on A&E network versus on Velocity, right? Uh, well, we can go much deeper than that with OTT because we know about the viewer, we know what they're doing on the remote, we know the, how they're interacting with us, and using ad tech, ad tech today, um, we can change the advert we're going to serve to them, you know, just a few seconds before we deliver it. Um, you know, we pretty much transcode these things on the fly now. So I think um, I think what we've found is because there's such a broad amount of content, and the the viewers on uh, on 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 streaming video on OTT are generally millennials more than anyone, and a lot of these millennials don't want to pay for it. <laughs> you know, it's just you know, it's on my phone, it's on my iPad, it's on my 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 box under my TV. And so they just deal with it uh, because they're getting something which is kind of premium for free. Um, so I think, um, I don't think that the ad market is going to get shut out. I just think, you know, between product placement and then being more innovative about what collections of content they're going to select and how they're going to cross promote that with their brand, um, I think they'll see success. You know, a lot of the channels we have at Own Zones are what we call how to and, uh, you know, celebrities that. Uh, teaching people, you know, whatever they're experienced and, and, and known for. Um, and as they're doing that, there's advertising embedded in that story, you know. Uh, you know, Jennifer Adams is showing you how to decorate a bedroom, and at the same time, she's telling you that these products are available online to buy. So um, I just think it's it's just a change. Uh, it's just a change. The, the hardest thing, I think, is for the ad sales guys out there that used to sell, you know, on network TV and used to sell a specific time slot. Uh, with a specific uh, show that doesn't really exist anymore, right? Those those guys uh, those guys uh, are are sort of dinosaurs. I agree with that, Aaron. So okay, so I, I like you know the, this concept of personalization, you know, and 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 actually we can go back a little bit to earlier in the conversation when we talked about you know the importance of data and data being integral to the viewer experience. So data obviously is really important for personalization. What about some of these other programmatic technologies, like let's say machine learning or artificial intelligence? You know, how are those going to impact the viewer experience as well? Well, I'll I'll take a gander at it. I mean, I think that's uh, that's going to be the biggest uh, you know the biggest breakthrough, if you will, um, over the next five years is 
how um, bringing together the different data sets that are currently completely disparate, right? Those, you know, prior to this, nobody who had the data around, you know, the assets was sharing it with necessarily the people who had the subscriber based data. Um, and so the fact that you can now in real time learn how these people are, or how these data sets are evolving, that you'll be able to, you know, do a lot with that. Um, I think it also, I think another element of this is as you start to get into more interactivity in video, um, and I'm thinking here about things like VR and so forth, you start to have uh, the ability to have more um, realistic human-like experiences inside of, of, of those environments. So there's a, there's a, there's a, it's a very good time to be alive with regard to how these technologies are finally uh, being brought to bear. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? All right, um, I've got a little fun question to do. Now, there, there are some rules to this question. Uh, obviously, there's lots of terms and phrases and things that are being bantied about in the industry. And what I want to do is I kind of want to do a lightning round approach to this. Is I've got five topics, and I want to give you each like just a couple of seconds to say whatever comes to mind about it. Right, so um, I'll give you an example. We can start with 4K, and if somebody asks me the question, JT, what do you say about 4K? I might say it's dead. 8K is going to rule. So there's something along, you know, something along those lines. Something just quick and to the point. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with Thierry, and then I'll move to Pete, and then Chris, and then Aaron. And I said I've got five of these, so let's kind of see if we can run through them really fast and just give uh, you know our our audience uh, something to chuckle about or or give them something to noodle about you know that uh, is, a, is a gut reaction all right so okay. quick Jason, response yes we're gonna start are you with counting the time I'm ready counting. steady go okay yep. 4k ultra hd hdr ott big announcement coming from harmonic at nab so we will show the first live channel delivered in hdr over the top VR is going to happen not in 4K but in 8K because you need to send native 4K using some kind of field of view technology. So this is going to happen, but we need much higher resolution on the device, but also on the capture. Mobile is the name of the game for streaming. We need to optimize the delivery uh, solution for mobile device, both way, reception, but also emission. Fantastic. All right. So, Pete, so let's talk about uh, 4K, VR, and mobile. Uh, so, 4K, I think it's state of the art. Uh, it's like I mentioned, uh, we just did this is the second year in a row we've done 4K uh, broadcast uh, from the Masters. And so, uh, that is something that is currently out there. Um, you want me to go to 8K? Yeah, 8K. What do you think about 8K? I think 8K is still a little aspirational given the current state of the internet, um, but you know, um, aspirational is good, right? Uh, VR, my yeah. V, with regard to VR, I mean, I've I've spoken with people about VR, and, and at least with regard to some of the the units, um, I've heard that it's actually 16K. Um, so if 8K is aspirational, uh, 16K seems um, extraordinary. Uh, yeah, so, right. uh, to do, you know, true interactive VR over the internet anyway. Uh, all right, mobile. Uh, mobile is um, really where everything's going. So uh, that's the, the short answer there. Everything's going to be mobile. Fantastic. Chris, 4K. Uh, 4K, I'd say standard. Uh, 8K. Um, required for VR 360 live experiences. Uh, VR. Um, still weighs off too much latency and uh, experiences um, are a little aspirational. Uh, mobile. Um, similarly, it's where everything's going. However, um, 5G is only going to uh, complicate the problem for networks. Ooh. All right, Aaron, 4K. Um, table stakes. Ever since Vizio came out and just killed the 4K market, everyone's had to do the same thing, and it's the minimum these days. 
I love it. 8K. Uh, hopefully it's not like 3D TV. <laughs> uh, VR. Fighting not to be 3D TV. Um, <laughs> just a lack of standards, and it's such a land grab, and so um, lack of content, you know. And I, right. I, I still feel sick when I use it. <laughs> <laughs> Add mobile. Mobile, um, mobile first. Release everything on mobile before anything else. Fantastic. That was a great lightning round, guys. I like that. A lot of great opinions, um, some disagreements and agreements. That's great. So I want to end this webinar. We've got a few minutes left. And um, rather than jumping to the questions, I think our, our audience would really benefit from you guys addressing a, a little bit of a future forward question. So, you know, don't spend too much time, maybe, you know, a 20-second answer. But here's the question, and we'll start with Thierry, and we'll go through the list that way. What will the viewing experience be like five years from now? Okay, five years from now, when you pick up an OTT uh, experience, it will not be different from what you have on the broadcast from a quality of user, and you will be able to have truly interactive application. One of the topics we're trying to address is the VR. People complain about the latency, complain about the quality, so this will be completely integrated in the network. Coming back from Mobile World Congress, I was quite happy to see that 5G is going to be an NFV SDN type of architecture, meaning we'll be able to put intelligence inside the network, and this will make a huge difference. Fantastic. Pete? Yeah, actually, a little bit of agreement here. I think uh, interactive VR uh, powered by uh, essentially taking the cloud closer to the consumer at the edge, so you're going to see more highly distributed cloud compute uh, within the major you know, networks that are eyeball networks. And that's one of the methods by which you can get more interactivity uh, or reasonable latency. Um, if you think about a, you know, a network that might be going back out to an origin and might take 60 milliseconds, which is way too long. So by shortening that distance um, to you know, 15, 20 milliseconds, you can actually have that type of interactivity. So I do believe, uh, you know, VR interactive is something you'll see in five years that's uh, going to be a game changer. Cool. Chris? I think you're on mute, Chris. Yep, uh, I was. So the cord will be cut. Um, in, in five years, I completely anticipate that the um, primary place in which people will be consuming their um, content will not be over the air, but will be an OTT experience. Um, and it must, it has to be as seamless as possible from an OTA to OTT, bridging the gap for a live linear, um, but something where you can pick up and, and drop off uh, on any, any device anywhere in the world um, a, as seamlessly as possible. I mean, it, it, I absolutely see we absolutely see more people driving towards an OTT experience first versus the OTA experience. All right, and Aaron? Um, it's going to be just like a meltdown of the world. There's going to be like 50 million satellites <laughs> at recycling place somewhere getting like crushed and recycled into aluminum cans or something. Um, the th VR world will be better than reality, and so nobody will want to come out of their bedrooms or their living rooms. It's Oasis. Uh, Amazon, <laughs> Amazon, and that will be delivering your food to you as you order it from inside your app when, without even leaving the broadcast or the game, and uh, will eventually be in the Matrix. I mean, oh, uh, craziness. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> awesome. All right. All right. Um, I hey, we have reached the end of our time. Uh, so I want to thank first of all, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Terry, Pete, Chris, and Aaron. You guys were fantastic. Uh, really, some great discussion around a lot of these challenges that are you know facing users and and content distributors and broadcasters and building a better online video experience. And I want to thank everyone who took time out of their day to attend our webinar. Uh, very much appreciate you, uh, you know, spending some time with us and listening to this discussion. So again, everyone, thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day.